Hello everybody, my name is Victor and I am here for another episode of Seized by Degrees. Today I would like to talk to you a bit more about wildlife photography and the surrounding ethics about the subject. If you enjoy taking pictures of wildlife, you probably wonder like how do people take those amazing pictures that I see in documentaries and magazines and art galleries? And often people think that the solution is to get close to the animal. And don't get me wrong, getting closer to wildlife does help if you want to capture details like scales or insect wings, but there are many ways to do this. First, you could invest in more advanced gear that allows you to zoom into a species that is either very far or very small. You could also use drones or other remotely operated vehicles to get a more unique shot of a species in a less intrusive manner. Some photographers even set camera traps with motion sensors that will take pictures of wildlife as they come into an area. However, all this could be quite expensive and some environments like swampy wetlands or the ocean can limit your ability to even use that high-tech gear. So if you plan to get closer to wildlife, there are a few guidelines and techniques that you should take into account to ensure not only your safety and well-being, but also the one of the subjects that you're photographing. First, read the law. Depending on which species you try to photograph, there may be some legal protections that forbid you from engaging in certain behaviors. If you live in the US, you can find these protections in legal documents like the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammals Protection Act, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. However, more specific guidelines may vary from state to state. For instance, the Federal Aviation Administration requires drones to fly below 133 yards or 400 feet. But in Hawaii, the legal approach distance for drones is 100 yards or 300 feet for humpback whales. So please, whatever you do, don't break the law. Next, research your subject. Each species is unique and you may have to take into account certain seasonality or even species personality when you're trying to photograph them. For instance, if you want shots of gray whales of the coast of California, you have to go in the winter when it's whale season. Otherwise, you're just gonna find a lot of water and no gray whales. If you're looking to photograph a certain behavior in birds like feeding, courtship, mating, or nesting, you have to account for the when, where, and how those behaviors happen. There are plenty of educational resources on the internet that you can access to learn more about your subject. Even some academic papers if you dare to read those. So be sure to do your homework and research the species if you want to get some great shots of it. Finally, plan your approach. Whatever you do, you should try to minimize any interference with the animal's behavior as you take shots of it. Your mere presence is already going to likely interfere to a certain degree as animals will be aware of your presence and just react differently because of it. But the idea is that you're not negatively affecting their behavior. Not only is it often illegal to disturb, harass, or hurt animals in their wild habitats, but it is also unethical. Your beautiful pictures should not come at the expense of an animal's well-being. Period. So how do you do this? Well, this can take many different forms, and I'm going to use two examples of photographs that I have personally taken in two very different situations. The first one is of an American alligator, which looks like it's pretty mad at me. So what was I doing at that moment? Was the animal angry? Did I disturb its behavior? Well, no. Actually, this guy is just yawning. If you pay attention, you can see the back of its esophagus, which is usually covered by a flap called the palatal valve, which remains closed when the animal strikes to prevent water from flooding its throat. I took this picture at Big Cypress National Preserve, a place where you can frequently see gators basking in the sun just next to the road. It took many visits and a lot of waiting, but eventually I saw this gator start yawning in front of me and I just took the shot. So really, this photograph was just about patience and luck. And that's a big component of wildlife photography. Animals are not just going to perform on demand. So it's likely that you're going to have to sit there and wait for them to engage in the behavior that you're trying to photograph or just yawn at you. The second picture is of a bull shark, a large marine predator that is not easily seen while scuba diving. There are a few places in the world where you can reliably go and scuba dive with these animals. Most of them involve some form of baiting or feeding from operators, known as provisioning. This allows you to get really close to the sharks and enabled me to take some of my favorite pictures of bull sharks. Provisioning for ecotourism related activities is part of a larger ongoing debate and it is not yet completely clear what the effects long term or short term may be on animals like sharks that may be fed or just attracted by those activities. Some papers say that it may affect their energy expenditures, what others discuss that it may not have long term effects on their seasonal migrations, and others even say that it may help research and assist us with learning more about these animals. So if you're planning to engage in this type of activity to get close to sharks, you should read the academic research that has been done on the species that you're trying to approach and see if there's any negative effects that may be developing because of it. In the case of bull sharks, much of the research comes from provisioning sites in Fiji. 
One paper's results couldn't show evidence that provisioning causes alterations with the long-term movements of the species related to its reproduction. A second paper concluded that bull sharks are likely to visit an area, whether provisioning occurs or not, and they just end up spending more time in that area if provisioning is indeed occurring. A third study showed that bull sharks may be meeting their nutritional needs from provisioning sites, and thus may no longer be carrying out their ecological role. But the researchers admitted that they were limited to 10 sharks that may simply be bolder at provisioning sites, which doesn't necessarily represent the impact on the population. Finally, another paper showed no evidence of incorporation of food provided, even for sharks that regularly consume food rewards which suggests that this activity is not altering their diets and is sustainable. So in the case of bull sharks, I couldn't really find much evidence that the activity was actually harming the species. So I felt pretty safe about engaging in it to take my pictures. However, future research may prove me wrong. And it's important to keep track on the ongoing research on this subject if you really have an informed opinion on it. So there you go. Now you know how to ethically approach wildlife and take pictures of it. Stay safe and go ahead and take some amazing shots. I'll see you on the next one.